My name's Aaron, and uh, we have a really special night planned here for you tonight. And uh, we're gonna jump right in because, uh, like I said, we have a special night, and it is jam-packed. Uh, we have three very special individuals that have, uh, some have come a long way, some that is right here at home, uh, and they're gonna open up uh, God's word and science and a lot of different things here tonight to encourage your faith. And, uh, and so we have a packed 90 minutes or so, and, uh, and we're thrilled to have each and every one of you. Uh, in fact, uh, a little bit later, how tonight's gonna work is we're gonna hear from our three speakers, and uh, they're gonna share a bit from their heart and some presentations that they've spent their life studying and, uh, and learning about the details of God's intricate design. And uh, towards the end of the night, we're gonna have a, a moment where we can have some question and answer. And so uh, if you want to, uh, you're gonna be able to actually uh, uh, text in a question or even come up to the microphone if your texting's not quite the way you wanna go and you're, you're not shy. Uh, we'd love to have some questions here at the end. So we're gonna spend about 30 minutes after all of our presentations are done and, uh, and have a time where we just talk. And you can ask some questions that maybe you've been wrestling about, maybe you've been thinking about in your faith. Uh, there's the QR code and there's the number. And so you might wanna, uh, as I'm sharing here, getting us kicked off, uh, maybe take a picture of that or get it on your phone so that when a question comes to you about one of the presentations, uh, you're able to ask it. And, uh, and so I'll leave that there for you as we get started here tonight. Uh, I was sharing with our, our speakers a little bit ago uh, that when I was a freshman in, in, in uh, college at Ohio University, uh, there, were, there was a semester where God got a hold of my life. And how he got a hold of my life was uh, I was taking some classes at Ohio U, and uh, there were three courses you wouldn't think uh, you would grow in your faith. And one was a human biology course, one was a history course, and then one was an electrical engineering course. And uh, as I started the, uh, taking those courses, my professors, they weren't believers. Uh, in fact, they, they kind of taught that class from an antagonistic viewpoint uh, for creation or intelligent design. But yet as I was going through those courses, uh, God got a hold of me. And I saw how the cardiovascular system worked and I saw how the muscular system worked and how our immune systems worked. And I just saw behind it uh, design. Uh, not just loose design, clever design. And, uh, and that changed my heart, and I started to open my heart more and more to the, to the Lord. I took an electrical engineering course, and uh, the, the Lord used that to inspire me in a couple different ways. Number one, uh, he inspired me that I was not to be an engineer in my life. Uh, uh, but I come in contact with math and mathematics, and, and, uh, and I learned that, hey, that's, that's a foundational language. Behind all that we see, uh, there's some ways in which God designed it to work, and there's a language that communicates that. Again, it points to an intelligent designer. And so that was a moment in my life that God used studying his creation deeply, deeply. Uh, as Jesus, uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 shared, we love the Lord God with our heart, soul, and mind. And so tonight, we're gonna worship God with our mind. And we're going to learn about how God built this world and made some of the foundations happen. And so tonight, we get to worship God by learning more about his creation and that intelligent design that he's given us. And so we hope that tonight helps you grow your faith. Perhaps you're watching online with us tonight or a later time, and you have questions. What is life about? What's truth? Well, we hope this conversation tonight about design and the world around us and how God intricately put it together helps answer some of those questions that you might have. I'll tell you what, uh, I'm gonna introduce to you our speakers tonight, and then I'm gonna open us up in prayer. And, uh, and so I wanna introduce you to Mark Horstmeyer. Dr. Mark Horstmeyer is the dean of the School of Engineering at Liberty University, and uh, he studied at uh, the West Virginia University and Ohio State, and we connect there because we have a little Buckeye in our background, and then uh, got his PhD from Georgia uh, Technical Institute, Georgia Institute of Technology, and, uh, and he has contributed in all different ways, fabrication, design, across multiple companies that have probably influenced many of the things that you uh, use from cars and even uh, worked on bombs in the, in the past. And so he's a brilliant please, man. Please don't and you have to bombs. throw that in there, Mark. You have to throw that in there. And so Mark is an incredible man. And, uh, and then beyond that, he's homegrown. He's been with us for the last five years since he came to Liberty and then serves around here at Thomas Road. And so we're blessed, Mark, to have you. And of course, if I miss any details, feel free to throw that in there as well. I wanna introduce you to Mark's left is Dr. Andy McIntosh. And Dr. Andy McIntosh, he hails all the way from the United Kingdom. And uh, so he's come a long way. And uh, he's a professor emeritus of thermodynamics from the School of Chemical and Process Engineering at the University of Leeds. 
And, uh, and he has been an incredible contributor, uh, talk, having this creation, intelligent design talk throughout his entire career. And, uh, and so he has uh, written books, and sorry, my iPad keeps messing up. There we go. Uh, and so he's an experienced researcher in the area of combustion, uh, sprays, uh, memetics. And so what he's gonna contribute tonight is looking at some very microscopic details of how God has worked. Uh, and together with his, uh, his counterpart, this is Dr. Stuart Burgess, and they've worked together on a book uh, that is Wonders of Creation, Design in a Fallen World. And so uh, Stuart Burgess, he also hails from the UK, and he's a professor of engineering from Bristol University. And, uh, and Stuart, he worked for the European Space Agency. That's our American equivalent of NASA. And so you know he's smarter than me. And, uh, and so he's gonna have some great contribution. And then Stuart also is uh, working with the UK cycling team, getting them ready for the Paris Olympics as he's working on the transmissions in their bikes. And so uh, Dr. Burgess, I'm still USA, but we'll be pulling <laughs> for you guys as well. So these are incredible speakers. And tonight's gonna be a very, very special night. And we hope it encourages your faith. So with that said, I'm going to pray over us and then uh, we will get started. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for tonight. Lord, we worship you tonight and your creation. Lord, we thank you for days one through six of your creative hand. And it didn't stop there. Lord, while we have influence, you are our ultimate authority, and our ultimate creator. And we specifically tonight just worship you and your creation as we, as we love you with our mind and we learn more of your handiwork. We learn more of your design and your heart behind it. Uh, Lord, may this night be an encouragement to those that are listening or watching online, and we thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mark Horstema. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate you all coming here tonight. Um, I'm gonna talk about this word creationeering, and, and then we're gonna give some examples a little bit later. So it was, an, it was a word that we trademarked at Liberty University. And the Lord gave me that word a couple years ago, and I submitted it to these two gentlemen, my brothers, and we wrote an article about it. And, and you all are welcome to get a copy of it. It was published in the Creation Research Society quarterly. And the idea is from the framework of God being the designer and maker. And when we read the word creator in the Bible, uh, a lot of us don't think of design the conceptual process of design. But he went through that. And then he went through the process of actually making it. It was two, two different things. So this process of engineering are these eight steps here. And most of y'all didn't have a class in that. Actually, I never had a class in that. And we wanted to formalize it here at Liberty University in our School of Engineering. And so we have different classes to cover each of these topics. Uh, we want to demonstrate this tonight. I'm going to demonstrate it through the notion of a football helmet. This guy, uh, John Grimsley here, uh, died uh, when he was fairly young. And in his mid-20s, he shot himself, committed suicide. And they looked at his brain. So a normal, a healthy brain is at the top. And his brain had this sort of dark black uh, material here to the left. And uh, somebody has Alzheimer's has that same thing. And that's called defibrillated tau proteins that gets damaged when a mechanical load happens and a shock wave goes through. And you're hearing about all these uh, football players that, are, that, that have died. There was a paper that came out about four years ago at Boston University where you, you're donating your brain. <clears throat> They'd had 111 football players. 110 of them out of 111 had some sort of problem uh, in their brain. Football helmets have been designed since 1930 for skull fracture, not for uh, taking care of concussions. So the idea here is in Genesis 128, the Bible commands each of us, the, the creator himself commands each of us to rule and reign on the earth. And when the students come, I try to tell them, God commands you to rule and reign, commands you to rule and reign. How are you gonna do that? So we go through a process. The first step is in research. Romans 1.20, the Bible says that we can understand God's character, nature, and attributes by the things he made. Now, it took me many, many years. It took me uh, over 40 years to really come to grips with God is screaming out in his creation about himself, about his character, about his nature. So we can get revelation from him and understand him in science. We can also ask him for revelation about making things. Proverbs 8.12 says, 
our, it, God gives us knowledge for witty inventions. So revelation upon science, revelation upon new ideas. And then Deuteronomy 8.18 said, it's your creator that gives you the power to make wealth. So what the, the demonstration tonight is understanding something in science and nature. In particular for me, it's football helmets. So I looked at things like these ram's horns and how these rams hit each other and they aren't getting concussions, uh, American bison, woodpeckers, things like that. And are there design concepts? Are there creationary concepts in there that we can use to create a better football helmet? And then serve mankind. Being from the Pittsburgh area, they won more Super Bowls than anybody, and I want them to continue. So I want to save their brains. Now, this theater, Von Karman, in 1960, was the first medal of science winner in the United States, called himself a rocket engineer, but the stamp, the stamp and everybody else called him a rocket scientist. He distinguished the thought process of science versus engineering. Science, first you make an observation, then you make a working hypothesis about that observation, then you do experiments for theory, more experiments for law. I just told you the eight steps in engineering. He always called himself a rocket engineer. We want to, we want to make that distinction here tonight. The Bible is not only clear about science in Romans 1.20 that we can understand his character, nature, and attributes. But Job 12 says, ask the animals and let them teach you. Ask the birds, the air, let them teach you. So I asked the Lord about 15, maybe 20 years ago to start teaching me about nature. And one of the things is this Fibonacci sequence. It happens to the lowest DNA to all the way to, to the uh, Milky Way galaxy and everything in between. That's going to come up in the same uh, ram's horn, and I'll show you why that matters. We did a study on the woodpecker. And this woodpecker, when one of my PhD students, Nyon Lee, uh, published it, it got press everywhere around the world. And the, the point is, how can these animals hit each other uh, without getting concussions? So what we found out from the woodpecker beak, that the outside was, was hard, the inside was soft. The beak had sutures, like these little lines right here. And the hyoid bone, which is the, the, the tongue that uh, went, is basically the tongue that came wrapped around, around the, the back of the head, had this Fibonacci sequence. So when a stress wave came through, it, it made it from what's called a, a longitudinal wave to a shear wave, which dissipates all the energy coming out. So that sequence is very important. For the, for the ram, we did these simulations. And again, the horn on the outside was hard, on the inside was soft. The horn had sutures on it, and the, and, the, and the head has sutures. And the stress wave, when it came through, you'll see this simulation. This is a shear wave starting, although it's initially a compressive wave. Uh, young boys, what happens is these young males go after the, the females, and they hit each other for it. It's not worth hitting your head for the female. Just remember that. So, but anyway, the shear wave comes through, and it makes a transverse shear. And you'll see when it gets out there, it sucks the energy out. And on the inside, we have the same Fibonacci sequence inside the concha, because some of the wave will go inside there as well. So it's hard on the outside, soft on the inside, has the sutures, and then this Fibonacci sequence, you'll see it comes down and we'll start shaking this out. You see that there? Okay. Now, American bison, they're like uh, offensive linemen and defensive linemen. So their skull, guess what? Hard on the outside, <coughs> soft on the inside. Are, are you seeing a trend here? Second thing, they had sutures. Third thing, they, they, they had the concha or the Fibonacci sequence. And the Fibonacci sequence here was inside of their skull. <coughs> they, hit, they hit right there where the uh, rams are more like wide receivers and defensive backs. They, they hit the horns, okay? We look at the American box turtle. Guess what? Shell is hard on the outside, soft on the inside. And the shell had sutures between it. So we did these measurements on, on the, the box turtle. So the idea then is, okay, let's take these ideas and let's put them for the football helmet. So to date, we have not gotten, although we, this is a design of the sutures and the concha, we haven't put them in the helmet yet. All we've done was put in these layers here, and you can come up afterwards and look, but the inside's really soft, and it goes to the outside. It becomes really hard. And just by putting this in to the football helmet, we're uh, better than 
uh, the current helmets that are out there. As you get smaller here, you're, you're, you're better designed. So this blue is, is where we're at. So we're effectively, uh, we, went, we made the G level below like uh, 60 Gs. When you're above 60 Gs, it has a 25% chance of getting concussion. If you're above 100, you have a 75% chance of getting a concussion. Our hope is to get it down uh, smaller here when we add in the other two features. But right now, we've only added in that one. So I want to remind you that Genesis 128 commands us to rule and reign. We're trying to do something on earth to serve people. We get the revelation from God in science. We get the revelation from him from a product, creating a business to serve mankind, okay? And that's the idea of creationeering. Now, I just showed it related to a football helmet. This can extend to other helmets as well, whether it's baseball, hockey, lacrosse, all that kind of thing. So we're trying to impact all of the cultures. In Pittsburgh, we only have uh, football, baseball, and the, cro and the cross. We don't have these other sports yet. But once we become champions again, we'll probably get the other sports. Dr. McIntosh is going to come up next. And he's going to give you another example. Well, uh, in, in the scriptures, it says in 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 14, uh, sorry, 33, it says that Solomon spoke of uh, a number of things, beasts and of fowl, that's uh, birds, and of creeping things and of fishes. So although it doesn't mention bombardier beetles in the scripture, it gets pretty close to it when it says Solomon spoke of creeping things. I don't know whether he understood bombardier beetles, but that's what a bombardier beetle looks like, seeking to spray against a finger, as you can see. And it's an amazing example of combustion. And that's what really fascinated me. Because it's found in, uh, mainly in Africa, the bigger variety, but it's also found in the US, uh, North, and uh, also in uh, South America it's found. It's even found in Europe, and it's usually under rocks close to water. The bombardier beetle has an amazing system of repelling a creature which may be trying to eat it. It ejects a mixture of chemically uh, heated steam and caustic chemicals out of its back end. This is separate to its digestive tract. It's not passing air like we might do after a big meal. So let's get that out of the way. It wards off predators like ants, birds, frogs, or spiders, and the beetle generally wins. Um, it, it ejects out of its back end, but it's, as I say, it's not a passing air after a big meal. It's a, got a movable turret, which, as you saw on the first picture, can even have it firing forward. It's much more versatile, though, than a tank, because it can even move the turret pointing right round, twisting it right round in the other direction. This is what it sounds like if you were in a laboratory with a bombardier beetle. Let's get this working. That's what you actually hear in the laboratory. It's not very big sound, but for a beetle, it's actually quite large. And if we slow that down a bit, this came from a, a BBC film some years ago on Tom Eisner's work at New York State, where he did a lot of work on the bombardier beetle. Few creatures will risk annoying a bombardier beetle. It mixes a cocktail of deadly chemicals in a special chamber. They react and explode at boiling point from its rear end in an awesome chemical weapon. So that's slightly slowed down so you can see what's going on. If you slow it down even more, you actually find that it's a series of explosions, and it's really quite remarkable. One of the really amazing things about this animal is its ability to spray in a very beautifully aimed fashion. And that shows up very nicely when you put the animal on indicator paper. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pinch very lightly one leg after the other, just as if I were an ant 
fighting these legs. I'm going to start with the right hind leg. Right front leg. Left front leg. At 400 frames per second, the action has been slowed down, but not enough to see the individual pulses. So they went to a lab and filmed the beetle at an even faster speed, at an incredible 4,000 frames a second. There were the pulses, each one corresponding to the individual bursts of sound. So what this beetle is doing is it's actually emitting a series of individual explosions at a rate of getting up to somewhere near 500 per second, which is pretty fast work. So it's actually what we call pulse combustion, and it's coming from two carburetors, I would call them, um, where you can actually see there, you can see that there is two combustion chambers, and what perhaps was not very obvious is that there is an outlet valve as well as an inlet valve. We did copy the chemistry. That's still waiting to be copied because it would be marvelous to be able to produce hydrogen peroxide in tiny little bits just when you need it. This beetle has an awful lot that it can teach us. That's why it says in the book of Job, ask now the beasts and they will teach you. The beetle has much more to teach us about how it senses where the attack is coming from, how it uses complicated chemistry, which we haven't, as I said, yet copied. But what we have copied at the moment is the valve system. And that is illustrated here. It's got a, it's got a membrane which sits on the exhaust, uh, which is then lifts up uh, from the hard cuticle which it's lying on, and that is basically a balloon valve or an, a pressure relief valve. So it's really the essence of it. It's rather like a pressure cooker where the water wants to boil but has to be allowed to boil by releasing the valve at the top of a pressure cooker. In this case, it's a valve at the back end. So we then copied the valve system this just shows you the stages in the combustion, just one blast of the beetle. The chemistry is set up with the catalyst on the inside of the chamber. The, the two, two components come in, hydroquinone and hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is used a lot in rockets. And then those two chemicals explode once they sense a catalyst, which for a, a living creature is an enzyme in this case. And then it explodes and then it comes out at the back end. So essentially, this is a tiny little combustion chamber and which has got this inlet and exhaust valve system. So we found the exhaust valve and it was that that was the clue that we were enabled to copy the whole system. The V1 doodlebug, which was sent by Hitler to, uh, as a weapon against England during the Second World War, was powered by exactly the same principle. It was gasoline burning in air, of course. It wasn't hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone. But it was the same principle for pushing this doodlebug, as it was called, all the way from Germany to England. So it's basically an explosion, but not just one, it's a series of explosions. A bit like having a machine gun on its backside. It's absolutely incredible. So when I saw this, I knew that I needed to learn from the beetle. As the Job says, ask the, ask the beasts and they shall teach you. 
There is complicated chemistry, as I say, which is waiting to be copied, and it's hydrogen peroxide, hydroquinone, which maybe others will be able to copy in the future. So uh, Richard Dawkins once said that it was very simple. You could just get rid of one of these chemicals and it would still evolve. Frankly, he didn't understand the chemistry, and that's in some of the papers that I've produced. But that's not the main story of what I want to actually share with you. Uh, the chemistry actually comes down very small tubes and doesn't actually take place until it comes into these chambers, and then there is an explosion which then causes not the propulsion of the beetle, although it is possible that it could be pushed forward as the blast of out, out of its back end, but actually it's causing the blast to go against the spider or the frog or the bird or an ant which has come to eat it. Here's, here's a little video done by a lady at, uh, in Boston which actually shows to you the, the, uh, the valves going off together on both sides of the beetle. So what did we copy? Well, as I said, we mimicked the valve system. So we set up a CFD program. It's quite, a, um, quite an effort because we obviously weren't able to take the exact shape of the beetle. So we got a volume, the same volume as what we estimated the beetle to have with a tiny little tube which was representing the exhaust. So all we did was we had cold water wanting to sorry, being heated up, so it was hot water ready to boil, and it would only boil once you released the valve, which is set at time t equals zero. So we let everything go at time t equals naught, and you'll see in a moment a clock going through, and you'll see that the blue represents cold water, the red represents hot steam, and the brown represents something which is in between, almost boiling and coming out of this setup. And we were able to simulate, if you like, the basic physics of what the beetle is doing. This, of course, requires certain assumptions concerning what we call laminar flow and not turbulent flow. Because it's so small, we can make an assumption about laminar flow. So you'll actually see, it looks like everything is going in that direction, but actually everything is being ejected from this tiny little 50 micron uh, radius um, tube. It's a very, very small little tube which is being simulated here. So the ejection is taking place in this direction. Red is steam, brown is almost steam. Yellow is hot water, green, blue is cooler temperatures. And at 1.3 milliseconds, We've almost got virtually all the steam out. Then by the time we get to three milliseconds, which is about 300 blasts per second, then we've basically got most of the water out of the chamber, which is pretty good going. So when I showed this at a conference, I was sponsored by a very generous Swedish gentleman who said, well, could you build one? Well, I'd never built anything in my life. Not, not, like, not up to this stand, of course. I've built all sorts of things as a model when I was a youngster. But I've never really done serious experimental work. So with the help of other people at University of Leeds, we built a chamber about 20 times the size of the actual beetle chamber. And we actually got it working. And we're aiming to do exactly the same here at Liberty University. Here's the first experiment. You can see the blasting of this. It's just water and steam. There's no chemistry involved in this. But we got the basic physics right, and this is a laser measuring the droplet size of this uh, ejection. Then we worked on this, and we tried to get it to much finer mist because people were interested in using this for an additive for diesel engines. And indeed, we've had a number of patents which have, we've taken out on this basic physics of the Bombardier Beetle. Um, one of our 
discussions with the patent attorney, ended up with the patent attorney saying, well, could we not patent the bombardier beetle? I said, <laughs> that's not possible because the one who made it is actually God himself. I actually was quite upfront about that. I said, you can't patent the beetle. But that was actually stated, which I found quite remarkable. Showed a bit of ignorance on the part of the patent attorney. But... Um, but as you can see, we've got a much more sophisticated system here, and we're actually running it a lot faster than the initial ones. So this is a very fine spray, simulating an engine, a diesel engine, where you're putting in an additive to actually reduce the nasties that come out of the back end of diesel engines. And it's actually being used in Sweden uh, as I speak. Here's another example. You can see how fast we're actually getting the ejection up. And we're, so this has been used for automotive uh, applications. So the major features of the Bombardier, Bombardier Beetle that we've learned are its incredible catalytic chemistry, which we haven't copied, uh, very uh, precisely timed inlet and exhaust system, um, the the valve system we have copied, we haven't copied the turret, but I'll come to that right at the end of what I've got to say. 400 to 500 explosions per second. It can maintain a burst for about two to three seconds. And we got a prize in some years ago, 2010. It's about the only prize that I got, but it's, it's good that that prize did come to us because Richard Dawkins was complaining about me and the also was complaining about Stuart, who was going to speak soon. But uh, he was making all sorts of statements which were totally wrong. So it was rather good that uh, the Times Higher Educational uh, uh, Education System gave a surprise for this work and the company Swedish Biomimetics 3000. I just need to say one last thing, though, concerning applications. The fuel injector, which is what you might have uh, realized was what I was talking about with the, the fast spraying system, which I've just shown you. Then there is the pharmaceutical application. There is also an aerosol and air fresheners application. But the one that I'm working on here at Liberty University is a fire sprinkler system because there are all sorts of dangers particularly in closed environments, like in a space vehicle, if you're going to send people to Mars, what's going to happen if there is a fire in your capsule? How do you stop that? You can't carry huge amounts of water with you. Water is exceedingly heavy. Another application is in submarines. You're surrounded by salt water outside, but you actually need fresh water, otherwise you're going to gunge up every system that you're going to use for putting out fires. So naval fires are also another application for this beetle system. So my idea is to have a targeted sprinkler. You've probably got sprinklers in this room. But if you had a targeted sprinkler system, which heat sensed a, a possible fire developing in one location, then you'd move the sprinkler such that it is spraying in that direction where the heat source is, is actually being sensed. So, as I've put here, space vehicles, naval vehicles, anywhere where fires are occurring or danger of a fire is occurring in a cramped set of quarters, and it could easily become a major hazard. So we've actually got, this is the rig which I'm going to be seeing tomorrow here at Liberty University, where instead of heating it from inside, they've got an induction coil, which was their idea. You've got some clever people here at Liberty University. These are undergraduate students. I'm most impressed with them. And you, here you've got the water inlet, the water outlet. This is an emergency relief valve in case things go wrong. You've got a magnetic induction heater here, which is a very clever way of heating the water inside this sprinkler system. So this, this is another picture of the same system, and I'm looking forward to actually seeing this working here at Liberty University. So I'm very encouraged by the interest shown, not only here at Thomas Road, 
but at the university itself, and I'm particularly grateful for the engineering department that Mark Holstermeyer is leading, which has really got behind this work, and I'm hoping that we can actually get an application for fire sprinklers working from this very university. So various patents have been got out on this uh, clever little system, which I didn't invent, but the Lord invented with the bombardier beetle. So I say to folk, Job says, ask the beasts and they shall teach you. And I've learned from a little beetle so much. And there's so much more to be learned. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about prosthetics, and prosthetics is a really exciting area to work on at the moment. Uh, it's helping millions of people around the world. Maybe there's someone here with a prosthetic, but it's also an area where the designs are getting better every single year, so a really exciting area to work on. But it's very challenging because it's very hard to match God's design. God has designed perfect limbs and it's quite a humbling thing to try to copy that. So it's a really good area for creationeering to uh, apply those principles of, of creationeering. Uh, the other two areas I've worked on for the British Olympic cycling team, uh, the transmission and also spacecraft design, they're actually very related because both of those areas, you need low friction joints and that's what also you need uh, in prosthetics. By the way, the, the British Olympic cycling team was very successful in the Rio Olympics and the Tokyo Olympics. I was designing the transmission uh, for that. In both of those Olympics, Team GB was ranked first in the Olympics. And I actually had to give a, an exhibition in London uh, explaining some of the design that we did for the Olympic bicycle. We had 14,000 visitors. And I was told by the Olympic cycling team, you cannot give any secrets away. So when people said to me, what was the secret to your design? I simply said, it's creationeering, which confused quite a lot of people. But it did start some good conversations. So what is the need in prosthetics? There's a need for greater compactness, greater functionality. It's incredible the functionality God packs into our limbs. It's very hard to copy that. Also, we need uh, lower cost prosthetics and also more customizable design. So there's a big need. According to the, uh, the World Health Organization, there are something like 30 million people around the world who need prosthetics. And in many developing countries, they simply cannot afford those prosthetics. So it's not just trying to get better functionality in prosthetics, but to get the cost much lower as well. So this is a really noble area uh, to be working in. So what is the problem? The problem is uh, prosthetic feet, prosthetic uh, arms, legs, and hands. They're too bulky, and the functionality is, is not right. These are very good designs. People really appreciate them, but there's a lot of room for improvement to get more compact limbs, lower cost, uh, limbs. So that's the problem. The answer uh, that I've been telling my lab, and not just telling my lab, but I've been publishing papers as well, uh, telling the biomechanics community, we need to copy the human body as much as possible. Only then can we get the functionality and performance that we need. Now you might say, well, wh why haven't people done this before? The reason is, God's design is so intricate. It's very difficult to copy it in detail. It, in the past, it's completely psyched out uh, designers. But the simple fact is we need to try and copy those individual joints. Otherwise, we simply cannot get the functionality that we need. So I'll go through three brief case studies. And the first one is on the human foot. I don't know if you knew this, but your feet are one of the most beautiful parts of your body and the most impressive parts of your body. Actually, the Bible says, beautiful are the feet 
uh, doesn't it? So there's even a Bible verse to back that up. Your feet have an incredible design. Your feet have this dual capability of being stiff and flexible. Now, if you ask any engineer, they will tell you that's normally a really difficult thing to do, very contradictory things to be both stiff and flexible. But when you push off on your foot when you're walking or running, your foot suddenly becomes very stiff. Your muscles and ligaments tighten up your foot to make it a lever. But when you land on your foot, it suddenly becomes very flexible because your body unstiffens those muscles and ligaments. It's an incredibly optimized design. If you read the biomechanics literature, uh, the engineers are in awe of the design of human feet. The human foot can cope with uneven surfaces. Prosthetics find that very hard to do. Did you know that if in a, in a, in a lifetime, you may uh, perform 100 million steps with your feet? And if you're a healthy person, incredibly, your feet can cope with that lifetime. And they're also a very compact design. So the human foot is an incredible, oops, sorry, it's an incredible design. So in my research group, we've analyzed the arches of the foot. In your feet, you have three of these incredible arches. You have 26 bones, over 100 ligaments, and every single bone, every single ligament has a precise function. In the red is shown the medial arch. Your first three toes form this very stiff medial arch. You even have this plantar fascia ligament that tightens up the arch as you walk or run. Then in green, your two little smallest toes form the lateral arch, which you, you land on when you're running. And you even have this transverse arch shown in blue that connects the arch. It also has these very complicated functions. It stiffens the medial arch during push-off, but it also acts as a flexible arch as well. It's taken engineers many, many years to really just understand the brilliant design of these arches. And it was through analyzing these arch designs that uh, I came up with a bio-inspired foot. It's one of the world's fir first bio-inspired feet that actually copy the toes and the toe joints. Uh, the way we overcame the problem of copying the ligaments was we threaded a continuous cable right through each toe. Instead of having separate ligaments, you can see this red line. We threaded a cable right through the whole toe to have a continuous uh, cable. Sometimes in engineering, you need to cut a corner and do things in a slightly simpler way, but at least we were copying the toes and the toe joints. And because we've copied the toes, we can cope with uneven surfaces. We found we could uh, emulate and produce a stiffness of foot that was similar to the human uh, foot. This has been published just in the last few months in the International Journal of Biomimetics. So this is uh, very much just off the press uh, research. So this is the first uh, example. Then the second example is the human knee joint. This is another wonderful, incredible design. In your knee, you have basically two mechanisms. You have a cam mechanism where the femur bone rolls over the tibia bone. And as well as that cam mechanism, you have a special four-bar linkage mechanism which you can see working there. Engineers call this an inverted parallelogram four-bar mechanism. Uh, the two crossbars are formed by the cruciate ligaments. They're called cruciate because they're in a cross. You have the ACL and the PCL. Uh, and it basically forms a hinge with a rolling, moving center of rotation. Uh, it's a little bit like, I don't know if you've ever seen a car steering system, Ackerman steering. Uh, it's like that four bar kind of mechanism. The next time you're driving a car and you steer the car, just remember you have a mechanism inside your knee that's more complicated than that steering system. By the way, it's an irreducibly complex system as well. 
And incredibly, there's a lubrication system in the knee which is 25 times better than in an Olympic bicycle. I would love to be able to copy that to make sure we beat the American team again in the Paris Olympics. I think we will anyway. But it also has a highly compact design. I should just mention one other thing. The reason you need this moving center of rotation and this special linkage mechanism is to get a high range of movement. You have to have this moving center to enable the, the lower leg to have this large range of movement. It's a brilliant design. God obviously loves mechanical engineering. So we studied this knee design. I had a PhD student from France uh, who spent, it took him three years just to get to grips with how the knee joint works. And he produced these lovely diagrams of the bones moving against each other and the four by mechanism working. We needed to do that study in order to copy that and use it in our prosthetic design. So this was our uh, knee joint, first of all used in, actually in a robot for a robotic joint. Uh, we produced these performance maps, uh, mapping the performance in terms of what we call the mechanical advantage, the efficiency, the rolling efficiency, and we were actually able to show that the human knee joint is a very, very optimal design. We published this in the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Uh, America has the best journal for mechanical engineering. It doesn't have the fastest bicycles, but it has the best mechanical engineering journal, so we published uh, a number of papers uh, on that. Again, using this inspiration, copying God's design. Again, we used this a threaded system for the ligaments. Instead of having separate ligaments, we had one continuous thread going in and out of the knee. Uh, we found that was a more convenient design, so you don't have to copy every single uh, detail. It's just too difficult to do that. You cannot match what God has done. Then for the final case study, uh, we, we've also worked on the human hand. Actually, this was for an exoskeleton to uh, aid disabled people to strengthen their hand. Like the knee joint, the hand is an absolutely incredible design with each hand having 35 muscles, each finger having six or seven tendons, which is, from an engineering point of view, just absolutely uh, astounding and virtually impossible uh, to copy. If I show you this next slide, this is showing you those six or seven tendons on the finger. Why do you need so many tendons? Well, in each of your fingers, you have three bones, and you need a tendon to each bone on the top and each bone on the bottom. Why do you need every bone to be connected? Well, with your hand, you can flex, so you need tendons on the bottom of your fingers, but you also need tendons on the top of your fingers to extend, so you flex and extend. Why do you need them to each bone? Well, by having every bone connected, it means you can do different kinds of flexions. You can do a knuckle flexion, you can do a full flexion, or you can do a half flexion. That's what I call over-design. God wants us to have very skillful hands, but to do that, he's had to give us all of these tendons. Now, I, I work in the biggest robotics laboratory in the United Kingdom, and there is no engineer who can put six or seven tendons on a robot at that size. It's just too difficult. But what you've got in your hands is one of the most precise mechanical systems we know on this planet, and engineers cannot copy it. But we try. It's very humbling, but we try. And this is an exoskeleton I helped to design at my university. On the right is a lady who actually had just had a stroke, and she was using our exoskeleton to give her the strength to hold a can to get it off of a shelf uh, so exoskeletons perform a very important uh, function. We also publish this in various journals. So in my laboratory, we have been very much uh, inspired 
by God's creation, also very humbled by God's creation, realizing how little engineers can do compared to God's perfect design. Here, I just want to uh, share with you one particular chapter of scripture. If you're interested in creationeering, creativity, look up Exodus chapter 35. It's a very special chapter. It talks about the design of the tabernacle, design and construction of the tabernacle. And it mentions how women are gifted in creativity. And it mentions how men are gifted in creativity. And it even mentions how God supernaturally gives the gift of creativity to the work people of the tabernacle. It's very inspiring. Uh, it's not just human technique that we need to invent. We also need to ask God through the Holy Spirit to give us that gift of creativity, whatever line of work we are in. So what is the summary? Uh, humans have incredible creativity. I've worked with some of the best engineers in the world. I've worked with NASA, with Panasonic in Japan, with many companies in Europe. The creativity of humans is incredible, which is not surprising because we're made in God's image. And if you're a Christian, I think you're more inspired to use that creativity. But God's creation gives us that perfect reference of design as we have heard. I think Christians could be leaders in creativity and business and prosthetics is a rapidly progressing uh, technology. If I can just show one more slide, uh, this was mentioned earlier, Wonders of Creation. If you're interested in that book, it is actually produced by Masterbooks in America. I was a little bit surprised. Instead of just taking our book from the UK, they actually did an American translation. It's been translated into the American English language, which is quite interesting, so you can buy that. Recently, I've written another book called The Gift of Sport. Not many Christians have written books on sport, but I thought, why don't I write a book from a Christian perspective on sport? I wasn't sure what to call it, but then I thought, why don't I call it the gift of sport, God's gift uh, to mankind? Uh, th there is actually a place in America where you can order that. Uh, but thank you uh, for your attention. I think we now go on to the question time. Thank you. Outstanding, outstanding. I'm going to pull up this uh, bench here real quickly. And thank you so much, each and every one of you, for what you just shared. Uh, I don't know about you. I don't know if you heard about a bombardier beetle, but I just learned <laughs> immensely about the bombardier beetle. And, uh, you know, uh, if you would, um, actually, the clicker is right there. I want to put up on the screen, if you could just click forward, Dr. Bird, just one more time. I think it'll bring up the QR code that folks can uh, text in their question. And if you have a question at all, we'd love to, you can text it right here, and it goes right here through the power of technology uh, to this iPad. But to get us started, uh, I was just curious, Dr. Horstemeyer, uh, you've, been, you've been a part of companies, you're training students now. Uh, as you got into engineering and design, uh, what are some of the ways in which God used that to speak to you, and how that's equipped you to um, love others, share his word, uh, both with love and then also logic? It's a good question. In fact, Stuart and I talked about this at lunch today, that in the educational process of all the engineering, I learned more about science and really not engineering, not design. And when I worked at Sandia National Labs, we were designing uh, the thermonuclear bombs, and we had, I lived through that design process. Uh, so it was really at work the first time. And then, of course, getting into the automotive industry, if anybody has a Nissan Altima Maxima or Quest van. Me and my students designed a lot of those structural parts. So if any of you crashed in that, hopefully you were safe. That's my hope. Uh, but but it, was, it was really in practice. And then we created here this process, and Stuart and Andy been, have been a part of that almost from the beginning uh, of trying to implement that to teach the next generation uh, the, and, and the distinguishing between the science and the engineering. 
Yeah, and I don't know, Dr. McIntosh or Dr. Burgess, do you have anything uh, along those lines as well that you might share? So what personal experience as to how it's helped us. Yeah, um, I, I just am amazed that, I mean, I, I never expected there to be combustion in nature, you know, burning, actual sophisticated combining of two chemicals. Because, I mean, you know, you know that you can't play with chemistry. If you have a chemistry set, if you just leave a, a little child playing with chemistry, he's likely to blow himself to bits if he's not careful. So the idea that uh, this little creature could have evolved is frankly nonsense because you've got, it, 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 you've got the danger that the creature, if it doesn't have the right combustion chamber, is going to be playing with two chemicals which could literally blow its back end off. <laughs> so it's... It, it, it really does need controlled systems when you've got chemistry involved and you've got high pressure. You've got the danger of the, the, what we call the cuticle not being hard enough. It could give way. It could, you, you could have a lot of nasty accidents on the way. But Bob and Dear Beatles have been managing quite fine without any problems for a long while. <laughs> and... People, of course, line up all the Beatles and they try to say that these are the primitive ones. That's what they tend to do. And they, they're the ones which no longer have the ability to make hot water or hot quinones come out of the backside. But actually, I think it's the reverse. There are some creatures like the bombardier beetle, which are, they're, they're, they're another they're another, they're related to the bombardier beetles, but they've lost their ability to blast hot fluid. They still ooze out quinones, which are not very nice for ants and spiders to scent. But really what's happened is that clearly the original bombardier beetles were doing it fine, and we still have those. But some have lost the ability. There's been mutations, just like you've mutated the English language. The original is over with us in England. You know, it's the same principle. Mutations. We still, we anyway, still we won't go down there. Though. Mutations degrade things. Yeah, exactly. Don't mutations degrade it. So, that's, sorry, I'm being a bit naughty. But uh, uh, we were joking before. We still use the word shenanigans. That that kind yeah, of made, that yeah, crossed the bond. Yeah, well, yeah. it's a bit of shenanigans yeah. going on in the understanding of Bob Deer Beatles. But just coming back to your point, on a serious point, I was just so impressed that there is real combustion going on in nature. And by the way, there are plants, I don't know whether you knew this, some cones, the, the, what's called the knob cone pine, only opens under fire conditions. And it's deliberate, because God knows it's going to be forest fires. And so there is, there is another example where combustion is essential in order to release the, the seeds, which only come out when there is a forest fire. And that then seeds the next generation of that particular fir tree or uh, evergreen tree. So th there is a lot, th there are many things which I've learned as a result of asking the right question. How does it work? When I went to the biology department to ask whether they'd like to join forces with me, they said, why are you interested in the bombardier beetle? It's been evolving. Uh, over millions of years, and it's got no lessons for us to learn from. I thought, how sad, because those biologists weren't, weren't asking the question how the beetle worked, their new innovations were lost. So, of course, that led to me working with a little bit with Tom Eisner over here. He, he was an old-fashioned, old you know, let's find out how it works biologist, and I could work with him a little bit. Um, so you need to have people who are asking the right questions in science, and it's led to innovation because of belief in creation. Dr. Burgess, you were talking uh, just a moment ago, and I have some questions come in, so keep texting those in. I'm going to jump to these in just a moment. Uh, every time I drive in, actually coming into the office, um, we have a, a nice field turf that's on the outside there. And it's incredible because uh, field turf's everywhere. You see it in sports all the time, and you, you wrote a book about this. And, um, and I was just curious, you know, you were talking about design, its purpose, its intric intricacies, and the like. And uh, we're doing our best to create grass, the thing that God blessed us with from the start. 
uh, to create grass. But as you've studied all the intricacies of design, whether it's human body, maybe it's sports, or all the different engineering that we've had, the importance of purpose and what that reveals another layer of intelligence and I believe a, an intelligence giver, uh, even beyond that. I was just curious, your thoughts, jumping off of that point, then uh, the importance of purpose beyond design. Yeah, um, just a couple of weeks ago, I was giving talks in Germany, in Europe, and I was in a school, and I said to the school, these students, uh, why do we have grass? And they gave some good answers. They said, well, it's food for the cows, and then they said, well, it's a nice green background color for flowers. I thought that was a very good answer. And, they said it gives oxygen, and I said that these are really good answers, but you haven't named the first purpose of grass. The first purpose of grass. And they just couldn't get it. And I said, do you want me to tell you? They said, yeah, tell us. It's for sporting for mankind. It's perfect for a golf course. <laughs> it's perfect for soccer. Amen. I'm not sure if it's, anything's good for American football, but it's good for soccer and golf. Um, this world Just is a man-centered world. When I study creation, not only does it reveal intelligent design, it reveals a God who loves man, that kind of purpose. God is a God of detail. Sometimes people say the devil's in the detail. God's in the detail. If you just consider the, the touch sensors in our fingers, the taste buds in our... God has designed each individual one at a microscopic level. He wants us to enjoy the taste of food. He wants us to enjoy the sights and sounds of creation. Why did he create, let's go back to grass. You can slide on grass and your knees don't get cut. What happens if you slide on artificial grass? You cut your knees. <laughs> Scientists cannot make a blade of grass. They cannot copy what God has designed. <laughs> God designed grass for our knees to slide on. That's the number one design requirement of green grass, going back to your example. So, yeah, we live in a purpose-driven world. God loves man. That's a great answer. And, and, um, and uh, it goes back to some of your research for preventing concussions, grass, and, and some of the like. I actually got a question that came in for you, Dr. Hor Horstenmeyer, so I wanted to read it. In addition to football... Um, can you share any other uh, creating research that you have done? Um, and then a, a, alongside that question is a person that, um, one of former veterans in the room, he shared that, uh, hey, um, in the military, there are concussions. Is there any uh, applications that you see perha perhaps for a military standpoint to reduce con concussions with what you've learned through your studies, um, per perhaps blast victims and, and the like? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, one of my PhD students actually, uh, he's head over all the biomechanics in NASA now at Houston, Christian guy, Andy knows him, is Dr. Raj Prabhu. He did a study where there was a bomb that exploded about 300 feet away, and, and the young lady was behind a concrete wall, and the shock wave came, and she thought she was behind a concrete wall, she thought she was fine. Later, she, uh, she went back, she had a headache. And what happened, the shock wave came through and it caused a contusion in her brain. So in, in, in other words, the blood vessels uh, expanded and even tore. So blood was uh, going to her brain. And Raj was able to show with our computational tools to simulate that. So once you can simulate these behaviors of the animals, the humans, then we can design around it to, to optimize those. The other things related to creation is I've been involved here and we have students here working on what I call simulating Genesis, simulating the days of creation, simulating the Genesis flood using the high-performance computing simulations to, to come up with a, an apologetic, basically to reduce doubt, reduce unbelief, to get rid of those barriers so that you can enter into your faith at a greater level without those nagging things there to receive more of what God has for you. And uh, so, so those are the kind of things. If anybody's interested in those sort of things, you can certainly come up and talk to us later. Another question, I think it's a great question. Um, this could go to anybody that uh, wants to jump in. Uh, what would you say is the most obvious thing God uh, has done or that you've seen in creation and nature that you find that people just seem to, to miss or not notice that you wish that they did? Well, there, there is a, that, that each, each of the aspects of the beetle that I've just been saying are, are, are just massive pointers to his intricate design. 
I mean, to have a turret which can move in any direction it wishes is yet to be copied. Everything has a purpose. So the, the evidence, once you go down to the minute <clears throat> level, and even at the larger level, shows purpose all the way down, that there, it's there for a reason. And I, I think, uh, as Stuart said earlier, people have said the devil's in the detail. It's really his design is in every single detail of each one of the aspects that we've been looking at. I've actually uh, recently been looking at DNA and the way that the DNA is actually held together with its carrying information on it, right? But the information is actually there to cause the bonds to be formed of the what we call the basic substrates. So the information is sitting on a system which itself is being programmed for by the very information in the DNA. The DNA is actually controlling all the energy bonds. The, the information in the system is controlling the energy of the points where there is the contact with, with the what we call the substrate. So, frankly, there is an amazing system of control in even in the DNA molecule. And I've recently started looking at this concerning the energy bonds which are going on. We just, we just assume, oh, well, DNA can just form. Actually, it can't just form. It needs an information system in order to make DNA form. You cannot just simply throw information and expect it to sort out the DNA. You actually need to have a thermodynamic system to actually translate the information system into recognizable what we call nucleotides, G, A, C, and T. And from a, th a thermodynamic engineering point of view, DNA is a marvel. And the biologists just assume that DNA could just evolve. No, it can't. You've actually got to have an information maker to actually form the very DNA on which the information sits. That's excellent. And I, I, I love that point that you just made there. Um, you know, if you think about it, uh, we can see further away than we've ever been able to see before. We can see uh, smaller than we've ever been able to see before. But at every single level, uh, it still reveals order, design. Yeah, uh, exactly. Even uh, as far now as the James Webb telescope can see, yeah. right. uh, every microscope, uh, you still see God's signature on every cell, particle, Absolutely. And, and the like. And uh, it's fascinating. Another question. Hey, Aaron, I, I, wanna, yeah, absolutely. I want Stuart to actually answer that, but I'm going to couch it that, you know, when the Bible says we are trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, you know, the Bible says consider the ant, uh, let the fish teach you. My challenge to everybody out there is if the Bible said that, if God said that, then study that for a while. So we had a discussion about trees. You, you, you just floored me at lunch about the purpose of trees. Can you just say something to that for everybody? Yeah, it's, um, and also going back to the question, it's so easy to take things for granted. I mean, if you just take trees, in uh, Genesis chapter two, it says, God created the trees pleasant to the sight. So he didn't just create trees, he created, he deliberately put beauty into trees. And trees do so many things, you know, it's a home to birds and animals. It gives us all kinds of wood. It just so happens that the whole variety of trees that we have give us every kind of wood that we need. There are even trees that are specifically optimized for musical instruments like cellos and violins, wood like spruce. They're actually called musical trees. They're so well designed uh, for, for musical instruments. And I've heard people say, oh, this is a wonderful coincidence. We have just the right wood for, for human use. There's, not, there's nothing missing that, that we need. But it shows God's love for man, his pre-planning. And whatever part of creation you look at, you see everything, uh, that all the foods we need, all the metals we need, all the woods we need. Um, again, it goes back to that purpose and God's love for man. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, let's see, a question that came in here, um, again, to whoever it applies. You mentioned the difficulties with replicating, so this would be uh, 
Uh, Dr. Burgess here. You mentioned the difficulties of replica replicating the body's design. Can engineers pinpoint the sources of those difficulties? And do they know what knowledge or technique or technology they would need in order to bridge the gap? Yeah, okay, so one example, it's very difficult to form connections. I mentioned ligaments in my talk. It's very hard to make separate, it's, you can make separate bones, but to make that joint of ligaments is a very difficult thing. The joints become the weak point. What God has cleverly done in the human body, he integrates, so the ligaments are finely integrated with the bone. They grow into them. Whereas engineers, we tend to have nuts and bolts and glued joints. So our joints are not as good as God's joints. So that's something we're doing a lot of research on, trying to copy the way God has integrated everything. Um, very difficult to produce muscles. Muscles are incredible things, these high strain, what we call high strain actuators. Engineers are making some progress on that. I've produced some in my lab, but it's a long road. We're years from uh, copying. So yes, engineers have highlighted particular weaknesses, particularly the joints example. Next question, can you expound on the Fibonacci sequence and how prevalent that is in God's creation? <laughs> I guess I'll start since I put the slide up there, right? <clears throat> I was first introduced to the Fibonacci sequence. I was at a conference. There was 100 of us in the room, and they put 100 pictures up, and they were old women, old men, young women, young men. They were from all over the world. And the guy challenged us and said, you probably heard beauty was in the eye of the beholder, and I want to show you it's not. It's mathematics. And we're like, oh, okay. So we took this... We took this test, and I put who I thought was most beautiful all the way down to the least beautiful, all the way, one through 100. He, we, we handed all these in, and he's talking to us about how the Fibonacci sequence is a law of beauty. So, for, for, for example, uh, the pictures I showed earlier, there's a sequence. So the Fibonacci sequence is 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 5 is 8, 5 plus 8 is 13, and you keep going up that sequence. And and and. If you put the two plus three plus five and you take the centroids, it makes this spiral, okay? And they say the ratio of three by five, that's why we have a three by five card, because supposedly it's the most beautiful, or five by eight, or that sort of thing. So anyway, they come back later, and 95% of us got the exact same one through 100. And he showed that the number one most beautiful person had the Fibonacci sequence, like their, their mouth to their nose was three to five times their nose to their eyes, their eyes outside. And whenever the ratio was, was at that sort of thing, we ranked them better looking, okay? So it was mathematics. So what I, show, what, what, what I noticed in all these things here is it's not just a law of beauty, but it has to do with waves. We, we see light, we hear sound. By the way, um, Einstein, or, or, uh, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony was designed to have all, all Fibonacci sequences through everything. We say well, that's one of the most beautiful things we know. Because, again, it was waves, but sound waves, not just light waves. Well, this is a stress wave, a, stre a stress wave on how vibrations happen. And there seems to be some optimization there with it. So, again, it's from electrons. The way, the way trees, the stems go from trees, it's a Fibonacci sequence coming up. That sunflower is a really good example of how it goes out like that and even uh, to the wick Milky Way. So this is like how the spirals happen in that sequence. I, I had per, jump off of that. Or, yeah. There's also Fibonacci series in, uh, in music. There is golden ratios in, in the way that the sounds are put together of the tones and semitones on a piano. We've got a whole section on mathematics <laughs> and beauty in our book, the... Um, this is a summary of the, the bigger book, but uh, the big book has a whole chapter on mathematics and music. So the great composers almost intuitively had the golden ratio, which is the limit of the number 8 to 13, 15 to, what's it, 8, 13, 21. And if the ratio of one Fibonacci to the next is getting closer and closer to the golden ratio. The further on you go, 1.612. And so the, you'll find a lot of music actually has that ratio in it. That's the number of bars on one theme compared with the, the theme before. And it's also even in the notes themselves, the notes of the piano, right? 
the original harpsichord p pianos, or the, like the harpsichord, were um, the, the ratio of, the t of each note one to another was actually in the ratio of uh, Fibonacci numbers. Now we have the tempered scale because you want to actually change from one key to another, which is why, by the way, music in one key sounds different when it's played in E-flat than if it's played in C. The reason is because we now have the tempered scale. So that's to enable transition from one key to another. But the basic keys, when they first came out in the Western scale, uh, were all to do with the Fibonacci series. It's very interesting. Uh, jumping off of that a little bit, Kepler, thinking the thoughts of God, is that an example of that? You know, when we come in, in contact with these elements of beauty or design, is that us discovering his thoughts and how he sees things? What do you think? Yeah, Johannes Kepler said that. Um, speaking of Johannes Kepler, tomorrow from 3 to 340 is an eclipse. And an eclipse is a demonstration of God's design. Um, the sun is exactly 400 times larger than the moon and it's exactly 400 times further away. So there's no other places in the universe where somebody's sitting and you have a satellite like a moon and a sun except here. Exactly. It is utterly amazing. As Mark says, there is no other known solar system that has this behavior. There's certainly no other moon relative to its planet in our solar system, which is close enough and big enough to actually have the same angular distance as the sun. But there's, as far as we know, there's no other extrasolar system. Obviously, it's very difficult to work out sizes. They've only just discovered extra solar system planets in the last, what, five or six years. But it, it's, it is unique to this planet that we have a moon, which is almost exactly 400 times smaller and yet 400 times closer than the sun around which we rotate. It's really quite remarkable. Yeah, I think the, the, uh, one of the tests of a really top designer is they can produce function, optimal function, and beauty at the same time. One of the difficulties of designing a brilliant sports car is that it's got to function really well and at the same time be very aesthetic. It's really hard. But everything God designs, he does that. So the moon is perfect for gravity and all these other technical functions. Right. And yet, on top of all that, God can still produce an eclipse. But whether you study flowers or trees, whatever it is, God can do both things, function and beauty, at the same time. Exactly. I like this question. Um, you talked about the use of creationeering for the design of material things. But could this also be applied to non-physical fields, such as psychology? Uh, parentheses, possibly studying systems versus structure. Such as what? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Such as psychology. Ecology. Psy psychology. Psy psychology. Psychology. Okay. Uh, the spiritual dimension. Yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's ubiquitous, meaning it's the way he thinks. And I don't mean to be presumptuous by that, that he had to go through a process. And if you look at Genesis chapter 1, the very systematic way. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it says the earth was without form and void. So it, 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 it was without form. It didn't have structure. And it didn't have substance. It was void. And if you look at day one, he separated light from darkness to give structure of light. And day four, he put the light givers, sun, men, and stars. So structure, substance. And day two, he separated the waters above from waters beneath with the firmament. Day five, he put the animals of the sky in the water, the substance. So structure, substance. Day three, he separated the land from the waters beneath. So day six, he put the substance, he put the land animals and mankind. Yeah. So, so there's, a, there's a very distinct creationeering process that he described and he went through. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Uh, I was thinking, actually, when I was reading this question, I was thinking of uh, model cars. Anybody put model cars together? And uh, when you put a model car, it's a piece of plastic, but you get some glue. 
The glue isn't actually glue, it actually molds and melts the plastic together to form the car. I was always, I always used that illustration because I thought of the, it, 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 it modeled church growth and how uh, our goal as a church is always to bond people not to the church. We don't just want to stick them or put them together. We want, want folks to bond to the church because they're mm. uh, the body of Christ. Mm. And uh, in, in design, in, in our world around us, um, I think God does give us clues and hints of how he works beyond just um, material, but also relational. And, uh, and I think that's a, actually a, a great uh, great point. Another question here that I think is great because it's happening all the time and you're hearing about it all the time. Uh, what are your thoughts on AI technology? Uh, and have you been able to use any AI technology in your research? I don't think I've... I, I, that's, AI has really only come in in the last year, two years maybe, in big time. Um, yeah, it's, it, I'm not sure it can, I don't think AI can ever replace originality and creativity, which I am saying is vital for innovation. Um, copying nature, you see that there is purpose right from the word go. If you're going to use an artificial intelligence tool, I guess you could... You, could, you can make computers to take out the drudgery uh, of say, well, let's go through a lot of examples and or compare data. them. Or data. And sort of get all the data organized. And so the artificial intelligence can see patterns developing. And that, that could be useful in actually demonstrating that there are patterns in the data <coughs> that one's perhaps using to get some inspiration for future ideas. But I don't think AI can actually replace the creative, creative aspect of good engineering. As was quoted earlier by Dr. Hostemeyer, um, von Karman said that true engineering is putting something there which has never existed. You know, and that, that's, that's what real engineering is about. It's not just classifying what's there. That's where AI can be helpful. It's actually de developing something which wasn't in existence before. I don't know whether Stuart's got an idea. Yeah, I think AI certainly does have some, some very good uses. And in a sense, it's another example of copying God's design. Yeah. It's putting a brain in a system. But what AI has shown, it has actually revealed how clever humans are. Just to give you one example, I, I had colleagues who had a, a camera, uh, it was actually on a, on a micro air vehicle flying around and it had to analyze what was around. And they had a problem that it couldn't tell the difference between a cup and a bowl. <laughs> and I said, but, but that's simple, a cup and a bowl. And they said, yeah, well, it, humans look at very subtle things like shadows and they recognize things. But computers find it really hard to do some really simple recognition. So AI is actually revealing just how clever humans are. Yeah. The, the example that, that I have is we ran electronics principles countenance. So you start with electrons and you add all the electrons up and we, we tried to do something with titanium and aluminum and vanadium because that's the main uh, space age uh, alloy. I mean, aluminium, not aluminum. <laughs> <laughs> I used the degraded American version, aluminum. I don't add extra uh, syllables. To it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't so, so it took three years for two students to run electronics calculations to go into the atom level calculations to figure out what the right uh, atomistic potential was. It took three years. And another student then, after all that was done, but, but see, the database is already there. It took AI, if you will, machine learning, two weeks. So it took something from three years to two weeks. And if you remember when IBM, the computer Watson first came out, they had Watson play against uh, Bobby Fischer in chess. And Bobby Fischer beat, beat Watson. And then uh, the computer played Boris Paskey, a Russian chess player, and, and Boris Paskey won. Well, all that memory now is in the computer. And so now it's combining its memory, which is perfect, right? A computer's memory, to, with Boris Baskey and Bobby Fischer. 
And in time, it's playing all these experts and it's gaining all this information. Well, later in time, it beats Bobby Fischer and it beats Boris Baskey. And so for a lot of applications, we're just at the beginning stages of these things. Other things are a little bit more mature. But like Andy said, the, it can predict because it can take two plus two equals four. By the way, AI, it's just math. It's just math. And it's a language of math. And it's limited by the, by the database it applied the math to. So if it's going to extrapolate to something in psychology, to something in, in, in these other domains, it's going to predict something, and there's going to be errors. And when it predicts something, then there's errors, and then there's an uncertainty associated with those errors. It's, it, it can have problems. And this is why Elon Musk said, you need ethical bounds, ethical constraints on the design. So we have objectives in our design, and we have constraints and then variables. The objectives is we're trying to maximize or minimize. I'm trying to minimize damage on the brain. I'm trying to minimize damage on the brain. The constraints are, I can't go beyond this volume of that helmet. The NFL limits it. And what, what Elon Musk is saying with AI is we have, eth we have to have some ethical, moral constraints. Or it's going to be like Hitler in the Second World War, and they're going to start killing people just to get whatever information. You mentioned mathematics. This question came in, um, and it's been a theme, so I think good question. Is mathematics uh, something that's invented, discovered? Um, did it pre-exist? Go ahead, Stuart. Let, let the elder go. Mathematics is, is actually uh, a language, and it's, it's a language which presupposes logic. And it's very interesting that John's gospel starts very similar to Genesis. In the beginning was, of course, it then says the logos, the word. So logic is basic to God's existence. Logic and pattern and uh, the ability to reason is actually the mark of mind, true mind. So um, mathematics is the purest expression of logic. So that's something which I've always loved mathematics. My degree was in maths and all my work is really based on logic in the, in the early stages. And so writing mathematical equations is actually, if you like, the supreme example of what Kepler said, thinking God's thoughts after him. So... Uh, to say mathematics is an invention, well, in a sense it is, but it, the basic concept of logic is not an invention. Logic is something which God has given us. And I love asking students this, where does logic itself come from? Where does the idea that something follows something else and is a logical argument, where does logic actually come from? And if you ask... Uh, chat GBT, where logic comes from, they won't be able to answer you. <laughs> you know, AI can't, cannot actually make, it, it cannot actually tell you where the basic logic which organizes something into patterns, where that comes from. It actually comes, it comes down to actually something which is, is well known in, within mathematics itself, that there are certain things which are axiomatic that you cannot prove and yet are essential for mathematics to work. Mathematics cannot prove its own logical basis. It, it, this is a well-known uh, issue within the mathematical arena. Uh, if you discuss logic itself, where does it come from? It's, it's actually not possible to get underneath a lo logic itself. So mathematics itself if you like, is really, yeah, it's a description, but the basic idea of logic is a gift from God. Let me, let me add to that if I can. And, and he made a point about in the beginning was the word. And that word, the Greek word there is what he was referring to as logos. And the word logic comes from that. So in the beginning was this logic. So it's the fundamental premise. But if it's a language, which I believe it is, it's the only language everybody in the world speaks. There's only one language everybody in the world speaks. Exactly. Math. It's universal. 
By the way, yesterday one plus one equals two. Today one plus one equals two. Hopefully tomorrow one plus one equals two. It's constant, it's eternal. What's universal and what's eternal? God, right? It's his language. We rest our case. I just wish I could speak math a little bit better. <laughs> um, hey, we have time, I think, for just one more uh, question. And, and it's really just a question. I'd love for you guys to just start with Mark and then work across. Uh, what's a, kind of a closing word that you would give a person? There are several questions here. So I'll hint at a few of them if you want to throw that in. Uh, there are several questions there. If a person uh, wants to do a better job as a believer in the area of creationeering, intelligent design, ministering to others that may have an antagonistic view or they, they, they don't see intelligent design. In fact, they see more of the flaws. You know, the, the glass is, is half empty rather than half full. Um, how, what maybe encouragements from a ministry perspective would you share with our audience uh, to equip them to better minister in love and logic uh, as, they, as we part tonight? But let me just talk very personally. I remember when I'm going through college, particularly at Ohio State, Barbara and I were, we had a visitor over. I still remember this, Andrea Vogel. And she was talking about how the mountains are beautiful and she gets something from the trees. And I, and I was staring at her like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't get anything out of nature like what you're talking about. And over time, when I started contemplating these scriptures, let the ants teach you. Well, if he said consider the ants, well, then I should consider the ants. I should take some time and think. I should think and study the ants if he said that. If he said, let the birds teach, okay, I need to think about these birds. And I need to study the birds and let them teach me. If he said that, right? And so I started growing in this, growing this. And it wasn't until I was 45, and I've been around the sun now 61 times. And it was 45, and I used to make this statement, I'm the least creative human God ever made. I used to tell him, I'm the least creative human. But at that point, I just asked God, can you give me ideas for inventions? And so now I have patents on this helmet. The Bible says you have not because you asked not. I never asked. It was, it was 45 years old and I didn't even ask to get that revelation, right? And so I believe like that Romans 120 scripture, because he reveals his character, nature, and the things he made, he is screaming out to you every day about things that you're walking by, you're driving by, and you're missing. You're missing because you haven't, you, you're not seeing him and you're not asking him, you're not pursuing him to reveal himself in everything he made. And, but, you know, we, he's no respecter of persons, so you just ask him. He's not gonna, he's, he doesn't like me better than you, so he'll give you the revelation if you ask him and you seek him for that. I think that's the takeaway that I would encourage you to have as you walk out tonight. Yeah. Um, so can you just repeat the question that you asked to begin with? I'm, I'm not One, sure whether I'm quite getting it. Yeah, if you wanted to give a, just a closing last thought of encouragement to this crowd, if they're okay. uh, ministering to people that maybe they have a different view uh, or maybe they want to get involved in, um, hey, I, I want to make a difference in this area. This, okay. this is something the believers need to do more of and louder. Um, what, what advice would you give? I think we do need a whole new generation of young people who are prepared to, re, to regard academia as a place where, you know, you, you are again going back to the Bible, which is what Mark was advocating with creation hearing, and actually using the Bible as a basis for everything. And what really happened in the Reformation 500 more, 550 years ago or thereabouts was that we broke away science and all academic thinking away from its uh, Aristotelian Greek way of thinking, which is what had dominated the papacy for all that time. And it basically freed knowledge from being locked into, well, so-and-so says something is true, therefore I must believe it. Now we've got the same thing happening again. We're locked into an evolutionary framework for everything. Yeah. And we need to start thinking from a biblical base, from 
all the subjects, which is why, why I like the Liberty setup here, because mm. it's talking about champions for Christ, training the next generation for Christ, looking at your discipline through biblical eyes. And that's not just science, it's looking at all the subjects from a biblical point of view, even the arts, looking at it from a biblical point of view. And I think that's what we need. We need a completely biblical outlook for our young people. And I, that's what I believe we need in Europe. We, we're crying out for it. We were locked into an evolutionary framework and it's leading to revisionist ideas of history, wokeism, and all sorts of other things are being uh, perpetrated in our land. And so we've set up an organization called Truth in Science, which has a conference preparing Christian young people for going into college. And we haven't yet got a, a UK Christian university, but obviously we would need that. So we haven't got something the equivalent of Liberty University here on our doorstep, but we're trying to train young people to prepare them to stand for Christ in their secular courses and even in their Christian unions where people are being tempted to, to think that wokeism and all these other ideas coming in, you know, is somehow uh, correct. No, it's not correct. We need to have a biblical worldview in all the disciplines so in a small measure, we're trying to prepare our young people to stand for Christ in very difficult days. So I believe that what you've got here and what Dr. Holstermeyer has set up with creationeering is all part of that, training on a new generation to stand for Christ in this day and age. Uh, okay, <clears throat> uh, a quick list, just following on from Andy. Uh, get students to come to Liberty to get that correct world view. I think it's Absolutely. really important. Secondly, there are some very good resources and websites. I would definitely recommend Answers in Genesis, uh, also Creation Ministries International. There are some excellent online resources to learn about God's creation. And lastly, learn to see God's design and goodness in creation. Simple things like honey. I think honey is the most incredible example of God's <laughs> love and provision for man. There are millions of types of insect. Only one makes food for man. Other insects just eat leaves and dirt. Honey is thought to be uh, the most um, advanced food on earth. You can almost live on honey and water. It has medicinal properties. Scientists are baffled why bees go to all this incredible effort to construct honey. But the reason is to put it on your table so that you can eat it. So learn to see God's goodness in the details of creation. <laughs> that was excellent. That was excellent. I like to tell my students, every ology begins with theology. And um, uh, I, I, can you give a round of applause for our speakers here tonight? Uh, and I have a special thank you for each one of you. Uh, thank you for standing for the gospel. Thank you for uh, pointing us to God's design and that the how reveals a who. And, uh, and, and it's not a popular thing to do in each of your fields, but it's so vitally important. And it's a great reminder for each of us, um, for believers, uh, we stand on a lineage of scientists that started from Galileo on, that loved God, and out of their worship for God, they studied the world around them and they found a relationship through how God gave hints along the way. And uh, you may, again, be listening tonight, and you might be thinking to yourself, you know, I'm not sure, what is this life about? What is truth? And uh, hopefully you got some, some very unique, uh, but also some, a big picture of a big God that loves you very much and is communicating all the time uh, through the things you touch, the things you hear, the things you see, the things you smell, and beyond. And uh, so thank you for saying yes, Dr. Horstemeyer. I would love for you just to pray us out tonight. Sure. And, uh, and just uh, because it has been kind of your vision and what you, you wanted to share with your church. And so thank you for doing so. And thank you for the impact that you're making. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time we can just have here together with you. And uh, everybody who has set apart this time right now, we just offer ourselves to you to allow you to teach us your ways so that we would have hearts that would understand 
we would have ears to hear, we would have eyes to see, so that the, the, the information tonight could transform us from one state to the next, from one glory to the next, so that we could fall more in love with you to help us love you more in front of people and love people in front of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm sure uh, the good doctors will be yeah. hanging around and will love some Come questions. On I know there were many that we couldn't get to. Uh, once again, thank you for being here tonight.